So today, Ross will be talking about building digital confidence through action research. She'll be introducing and talking us through an incredibly exciting project, which seeks to develop digital confidence and literacy for colleagues working right across the heritage sectors, not just here in the UK, but also in the US and Canada. So over to you, Ross. Thank you for being with us and really looking forward to hearing your presentation. Matt, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody in the RL UK community for for making this uh, such a welcoming environment today and, uh, and all the conversations we've had le leading up to today. And I hope this isn't the end of the discussion. This isn't just a, a, a one-time uh, conversation that actually we can frame a dialogue over the next hour that, that is the beginning, is the foundation for, for, for many things we might do in the future. And hopefully that will become clear uh, as I talk over, over, over the, certainly the first half hour or so uh, when I take you through some of the bits and pieces and some of the work, some of the projects and initiatives programs that we've been, we've been leading here at Leicester over the last few years. Hopefully you'll see and be excited by the prospect of where we may be going next. So these sorts of events, you know, these moments, these seminars, these online workshops where you're giving up some of your valuable time, they're so much better when something real and actual and tangible comes from them. So maybe let's try and do that today. Let's think about how we might figure something out uh, over this hour and actually how we might pledge and commit to continuing the conversation and doing something real together. I have been in the School of Museum Studies um, for quite a long time, coming up to 20, 25, 25 years. You know, I was obviously 13 years old when I first joined. And over that time, I've you know, I've seen this, this intersection between, between digital and the culture sector to evolve from a, you know, a sector that used to talk about automation and computing and digitization to one that then started to, to think about museum computing, to thinking about digital cultural heritage to today, thinking about museum technology and news tech and so on. But as the, as the language changes and as the, as the discussions become more nuanced and informed by intellectual frameworks and, and the bookshelf of, of publications continues to grow around museum tech, there are some questions that continue to endure. And I think it's one particular question, a question around our confidence within the culture sector to work with technology that I keep coming back to. And I think that's the heart of everything that you're gonna hear about um, through, through this hour. I've been lucky enough uh, since 2017 to be leading a project, a series of projects actually, it's an international program and we can share the link uh, in, the, in the chat now, called One by One. And One by One has been funded variously by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, very generously across three different projects. Our first project was a, was a half million pound standard research grant there and, and it's grown since then. But we've also received funding from NEH in the United States. So we partner with SUNO, Southern University at New Orleans, uh, a self-designated historically black college and university, which is significant in so many ways, but particularly to the theme of the research that you'll be hearing about with us uh, later on. Um, tomorrow, we begin our fourth project with Surface Impression, a Canadian and UK uh, digital consultancy and design firm, and Culture24, who I'm sure many of you know, the extraordinary Culture24 sector support organization helping UK cultural organizations build their digital confidence. They've been partners with us right the way through this journey. And tomorrow we begin a Canadian Council for the Arts funded project, uh, Digital Action Research and Training or DART project, well, we'll be taking um, about a dozen organizations across Canada over the next year through some digital confidence building, uh, reflecting on their digital literacy and capability. And then for the next two years after that, we'll be doing the same. One by One is an international collaboration of academics and academic organizations, cultural organizations, professional bodies, associations, professional associations, um, policy makers and various policy bodies, um, as well as technology uh, companies and other sorts of organizations as well. So what's distinctive is that we come together as that ensemble, public, private, nonprofit, triple helix, um, seeing that those organizations are better together, knowing that we complement each other's skill sets. So getting into the habit of constantly exchanging that knowledge and having that knowledge exchange mindset um, letting go of leadership, allowing it to move around the network, um, seeing the and acknowledging the, the 
the needs that different partners can see are because of their particular work, taking time to build trust, respect and empathy within that group. So that's distinctive about us for, to start off with. We share, we do things in, op in the open, we're doing things for the public good. We always want to collaborate. Our default setting is to partner. So maybe self-consciously, self-aware, very overtly being, being adjacent to a much more competitive, rivaling uh, kind of marketplace of, of research. We also use action research. So we want to be a set of projects that get stuff done. It's great to write the books. It's great to have that peer reviewed article that disappears somewhere, um, sometimes behind a pay paywall, but hopefully not so much these days uh, with changes there to, to OA. It's wonderful to write those. It's, it's part of the job. It's a ref metric. It's all of those things. But in terms of people seeing your work and actually your work making a difference and generating tools and resources that can be practical and useful tomorrow for cultural heritage and cultural organizations, um, we therefore want to take an action research approach. This means we respond to points of local need. So an organization, a particular museum or a network or a family of museums or a community of practice, or maybe an entire museums association for a, for, an, for a country may turn to us and say, this is our priority, this is the need. We then as an IRO can then assemble, leverage, win academic funding. We can win that bit that will enable us to put in place a piece of focused action research we embed, typically what will happen is we'll embed our researchers within an organization or a number of organizations over some time. And then not only help that organization with that resource, with that expertise, with that trust, respect and empathy to do some good, but then the understanding is that the collective will give away and share the templates and insights and data and case studies that we put together. And if we're doing a workshop or a seminar for that organization, we try and make it open for others as well. We finally, as well as being a collaborative and that triple helix collaborative, as well as being a useful action um, research, uh, using an action research methodology as our kind of default, default setting, we also want to be strategically intelligent. We don't want to do research that is interesting for a particular scholar and where she may be going on, on her particular intellectual trajectory through her career. What we want to do is actually not to start with the university and its research theme and its research priority and that particular scholarly, um, sometimes quite siloed need or niche, but we want to turn to the sector and say, what do you need? What's the research that needs to take place here? We want to sit down with DCMS. We sit down with the National Lottery Heritage Fund. We sit down with Arts Council England. We sit down with Museums Gallery Scotland. We sit down with um, uh, a number of our sector support organizations and say, what's the work? Where's the point of need now? And we make that our priority. So that learning mindset, that research idiom, that intrinsically and reflexively collaborative approach, that is the recipe. That's the, the, you know, the, 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 the formula that has proved so successful. In many ways, this started in the spring of um, 2018, even though our, our, our program had started to assemble, it was the spring of 2018 with that Culture is Digital report that came out in the UK. So those of you that are joining us from, from Munich and from an Ireland and from New York, and thank you for, for waving to us in the chat because it's brilliant to see all of you there. Um, in a UK context, our Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sports, so our cultural ministry, laid down a really important challenge and set of markers about four years ago. In a report that centered digital within the cultural landscape. So digital is both the tools and ways in which human beings interact with their world, but also the technologies that are beginning to shape our sense of what that world is. Recognizing that the DCMS Cultures Digital Report asked for three things. It said, we need a much more cohesive vision an articulation, literally the words, to talk about what we think digital is within a cultural setting. How we use digital to support culture in a particular society, but how that cultural landscape is itself digital and has a digitality within it. So adopting digital within a cultural setting, but also adapting to a, a culture that has a digital inflection to it. 
So what is that? What is that vocabulary? What are those set of principles? What 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 are those 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 values that we might work to as a sector and an industry and a domain in that context? Who are the people then that can that can bring us together? That can can act as champions and agents and change makers within that space? That can kind of galvanize and be ambassadors and be narrators to that to that change that you know many of us are seeking. And finally, as well as that vocabulary and those people. What about some practical tools? What about some stuff that can just help organizations to understand where they are and what they might become? So another link we can share with you in the chat is, it's something we helped to build. So over the last few years, we were part of the team that put together the Digital Culture Compass. So many of you may have come across this. If you haven't, please, we encourage you to go and have a look at it because you know, this, is, this is what DCM asks for. This is, this is Arts Council England and National Lottery Heritage Fund working together on number one, articulating that digital charter. So you'll see that digital culture charter in there with its principles, its three areas around being you know, person-centered and, you know, and values-led and, and so on and so on. But you'll also see an extraordinary tool. And this is the tracker, the digital culture tracker. This is a free to use tool that any cultural organization can use. It's an auditing tool. It enables an individual, it enables a team, it enables a director or leader or an entire organization to shine a light in every corner of their organization, the main frameworks, uh, you know, the main functions, the main foundations of their organization, and look everywhere and ask a question, where is digital? And if digital is here, how mature is that use of digital and that presence of digital? And secondly, do we need digital to be more vibrant, more effective, uh, more accessible in this, in, in this particular part of our organization? So working through that digital culture compass, anybody can build a heat map of their organization, but also get a picture of what shape, what signature, what distinctive signature their organization has and, and, and what it might need to be to meet its particular mission. That culture compass is, uh, has been noticed across, across Europe. We have colleagues in, in uh, Southeast Asia who are particularly interested. We know also that in Australia, this has been noted and we've used it. We've actually used the tool within our, our North American work as well. It's a powerful tool. So we helped to build that tool, but we did a few other things as well. And let me share with you um, a picture of what we've done. We want our outputs from the one by one organization program. You know, we're about building a digitally confident museum sector or actually building a digitally confident cultural industry. We want tools that anybody can use tomorrow. Now, one of the things that we has emerged from the research that we've been putting together is I guess three words, contextual, holistic and purposeful. The reason the project and the program is called One by One is because we are flipping, we are changing, we are, we are querying that whole previous framework that assumes a very hierarchical, top-down, centralized approach to digital change. You know, what are the 10 skills that all digital curators must have in the 21st century? What is the five-point plan that allows any organization to become digital? For about 10 or 20 years, we've been asking the wrong question. We thought there was one set of unified uh, uh, steps that we all needed to take. But of course, the culture sector is so varied. And in, in, within the context of the museum sector, so many different business models, so many different sizes, so many different types of collections, so many different national and cultural settings that change the way the organization is funded, the, 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 the agency that it has culturally and politically within its society, the frameworks for, for uh, professional training and development and so on, as well as the fact that those organizations are on very different points of their digital maturity as well. It means it was always going to be a fallacious question to, to say, how do we do it? Actually, what we need to do is to give each organization the means to have its own conversation about its own pathway to digital maturity, to help each organization articulate what digital means to it, and for it to decide how digital and where and when and with whom it needs to be. So One by One is about helping the cultural industry, helping the museum sector to think about how it can adapt to a digital age and adopt digital technology 
but doing it on its own terms. So we'll transform the sector, not through one key policy document, but one museum at a time, one cultural organization at a time, one library at a time, one by one. So contextualization, contextualization is incredibly important to us. You know, whenever we're working with an organization, as some of the cards I'm about to show you, they help, they help an individual, they help a team, they help an organization to understand what their version of digital and digital transformation needs to be. We also ask that you know, through our research, what we've learned through, my goodness, having six postdoc digital fellows embedded in six organizations across the UK for, for a year, Museum of London, National Army Museum, Derby, um, Royal Pavilion, Brighton and Hove, and Good for Cymru, National Museum Wales, uh, uh, National Museum Scotland, we were able to really understand on our first project that for digital transformation to, to take place in an organization, for any digital change to take place, for digital confidence and fluency to grow, it requires the whole organization to lean in. It's about the vision and the leadership and the processes and the culture and supporting staff. So everything we do on one by one is not just about working with the IT team or putting in place one particular system or making sure one exhibition or one project has a digital element, but it's actually looking holistically across the whole organization. And what I'll get into in a moment as well is, is, is that final word, strange word, isn't it? Purposeful. What we mean is it's not doing digital for digital sake. It's, it's not just, following a digital path because other organizations are following it or it seems to be the template to follow. It's adopting digital because it enables you to meet the social goal of your organization. It's always turning to digital tools in a purposeful way, knowing the reason why that collection needs to be digitized, that platform online needs to be used, that particular experience in that particular cultural setting needs to be on a screen, why that resource or set of tools needs to be offered to the community in a digital format. It's always, always asking that we work in a purposeful way. We're so good at that in other parts of our cultural heritage, cultural glam provision. We're always asking now ourselves about how we are socially purposeful in what we do and what we, what we design, the program we put together, what we resource, the st strategy and direction of our organization. This is about being digitally purposeful. This is about whenever we think of technology, putting it in that context as well. Let me take you a little bit more into the detail here. So we, at the end of our first initiative, we were able to come up with a, well, this, this deck of cards. So this is a very practical way of giving to an organization. Literally, we have a beautiful deck of cards that you can have. And it's about gifting something to, to an organization, to a set of individuals, which is a great way of, of having a connection with them. It's about having something physical on someone's desk that's always there and not lost as a PDF somewhere. It's also about doing something that's defiantly analog and not having something very digital and complex, um, because actually the people you may be working with, this is about them building the wonderful phrase from Dr. Sophie Frost, you know, building digital courage about taking their first steps sometimes with digital. So the last thing we wanna do is to put something complex and virtual in their hand. So let's put a pack of playing cards that everybody knows how to play. And also, yeah, it's a pack of playing cards. It's a game. A game builds a magic circle. A game is very leveling. A game is where we can suspend disbelief a little bit and step out of the everyday and try something out. Whenever we play a game, everyone around the table you know, has an equal right to play and could win. Um, we've noticed how by using these cards, it can be a great way of, you know, the early career professional and the director, someone with a lot of influence around digital and someone who's maybe you know, new to using digital in the organization, they suddenly all have an equal stake when we've got them sitting here working with these cards. They work like this. The first is about helping you to decide what digital means to you. We did a lot of research. We looked at 50, 60 digital literacy models from around the world, everything from HSBC to the European Commission, to the Scottish Parliament, to Mozilla, to Barclays. Many organizations, many industries and sectors have thought very, very hard about what is digital literacy? What, are, what is a digital skill? What are the things that make up digital? Um, something we noticed, two things we noticed. First of all, all of these models are a shape, usually a circle, usually four bits of jigsaw puzzle connected together. They're, they're kind of locked and static. 
So you have to kind of use them in a particular fixed hierarchical sequential way, whether it's concentric rings or segments in a, in a pizza box or whatever. But the second thing we noticed about them is that they all assume a almost a, a Bloom's taxonomy, a kind of hierarchy of learning that digital is something to be mastered. They are very sequential, you know, knowing what digital is and identifying it, then developing some fundamental competencies with it, then knowing how to be creative with it, then knowing how to sort of work much more substantively with it, and then knowing how to teach others and lead others, and then at a very high level, how to be reflective and, and, and almost dismantle what you know and think and, and reflect and evaluate on, on the whole piece. It's a kind of classic hierarchy of learning, which is fine, but it, it immediately positions digital as something to be known, something to be mastered, something I need to develop, something that, that I, you know, I need to be on an educational relationship with. That might have been the case within our sector a generation ago, but we're becoming more confident now in thinking about a post-digital context where digital is much more normatively within the lives of many of our audiences and users, that it's there embedded again, normatively within the day-to-day -day operation and facilities management and business model and running of our organizations. And frankly, it's there and present and very normative within our, you know, the beats of our everyday lives as well. So there's a different shape for digital literacy that we think our sector needs. And it's one that, that allows us to just dis express the different ways that we have relationship with digital in different ways. And this, this card system allows you to assemble it in whatever way you want. So we say this, we say within our culture sector, digital is something we use. It is a set of pieces of hardware and software. It is a set of tools and so on, but it is a process. You know, we are digitizing, we are going through digital transformation. It is a thing we have a strategy around, a policy around. But many of our cultural organizations, they also create digital things. This is quite unique about our organization within, you know, within the sector of, of, of leisure and gas and oil and finance and healthcare and so on. The culture sector, it kind of creates digital things and unique things, but it also collects digital things in the world as well, really quite distinct. But also our cultural organizations need to understand the digital world as well. The museum, the library, the archive, other cultural heritage organizations and art organizations, they're mirrors to society. They're, they're a place in which we express who we are, where we come together and reflect upon our past, our present and our future, where we assemble the artifacts of, of our history, but also try to assemble those, those fragments of the world that speak to who we are today in our, in our beautiful diversity. So we need to understand where digital sits within that world, within that society, within that culture, within that reality. So the culture industry has a really distinct relationship with digital. It has to use it as tools. It has to go through a process of digital change, but it needs to create and collect digital things. But then it also needs to have an expertise on what is a digital society. And what is it to be a cultural organization in the digital world today? And how a cultural organization might comment upon the digital age today? We think this is a very distinctive model to help anyone start to think, well, which bit of digital am I thinking about when I'm thinking about my digital transformation? Equally, we, we work very hard to think about what is, what is a skill. It's a word that gets used so often, but it's really confusing because there's lots of synonyms and lots of words kind of get conflated and used at the same time. So we did a lot of work on this, and this is what we've distilled it down to. Actually, it's quite simple, and it makes a lot of sense, really. A skill is made up of three things. It's something you do, it's something you achieve, but it's also something you consider. So let me put it another way. My competency is the fact that I know how to use a hammer and I know how to use nails. So I know how to you know, use those tools. That's what I'm competent doing. My capability is that I know how to make a chair. So I can use my competency with tools and I'm capable now of making a chair. So both of them are aspects of skill. My literacy is looking at the chair and thinking I should have made a bench. It's that ability to step back to understand the significance of what I've made, put it in the context of other things I've made, what other people are making, what are chairs, what are benches, and then deciding on what I could do next and how my skill therefore might develop. 
just by starting to sit with someone and ask them about and their organization about, is it your digital competency that you're developing, you want to develop? Or is it your digital capability? Or is it your digital literacy? Is it literally teaching people how to use Twitter and how to set up an account and what to press or how to edit their first TikTok? Or is it about knowing how to successfully run a clever Instagram account that's just tuned right and pitch right? Or is it about stepping back and saying, actually, we need to shut down Twitter, we need to move to Instagram and noticing, noticing where, where, where a sh cultural shift needs to take place? These cards very simply help us to start having that conversation. What we also do with everyone is, is sit down and, and realize and notice in a way that doesn't usually get noticed when we have conversations about professional development and strategy and change and digital policy and skills development is who are we talking about? Are we talking about me, you know, the, the dad, the husband, the, the father, the person who's gonna go home and, you know, get on the bus and, and you know, get his phone out in the evening you know, and the person who uses digital at home and, and outside outside his place of work you know, but is someone who's then different when they are at work is it that person is it that person who needs to develop their competency or are we having a conversation about me and my role as you know librarian as documentation assistant as director and actually what I'm expected to know about digital in my professional role I may be completely off social media when I'm at home and I don't like doing things on screen, but at work, I may have a responsibility to work with technology. It's noticing that we have that complexity and it's okay to have that complexity and that the people in your organization will have that complexity. So let's start being clear then about you know, which aspect of my identity is it that we're talking about in terms of developing digital. Is it me within my community of practice, within Research Libraries UK, that actually it's a conversation about how this network needs to develop its literacy. That's what's happening in this hour. It's in this level as a community of practice, as a network that we're reflecting together about what we know about digital. It's very different about me knowing how to do TikTok on my phone personally. But then what about the sector? We may step back even more widely and certainly hopefully the conversation in the next half hour will get into this, that we, we start to look at each other and say, where should libraries be? Where should the culture sector be in terms of its you know, adaption and adoption of technology? But then there's even us within society. There's, there's me as a citizen, there's me, and there is society itself that, that you know, the UK, the UK, to take one example, I know we have a global audience today, but you know, the situation around the infrastructure, the connectivity, the national digital skills, the investment, the resource, the, the government policy, the local city council policy around digital and digital infrastructure and digital change, that will be different to our colleagues that are joining us today from, from the US or from Germany or from Ireland and so on. So it's recognizing that we could be having a conversation at that level. So just by laying a few cards on the table, thinking about which aspect of digital, what, what, what do I need to develop and, and what, what element of me, you know, what version of me are we talking about, can be a very powerful way of starting to have, on the one hand, a much more differentiated and precise conversation about digital change. But equally, it allows everyone in the room to have a shared vocabulary so that we have real kind of clarity and, and consensus around what these terms mean. I'll move on a little bit because there, there are other cards that we use. Dr. Lauren Vargas, one of our lead researchers, she's added to our deck and she's helped us to think then about the emotional dimension that we need, the, the empathetic skills that we need to then help us to, to embark on this change, particularly around digital leadership. The second project we did was with the US. So we had four museums in the UK, the VNA, the Science Museum Group, um, National Museum Wales, National Museum Scotland, buddied with four museums in the US, National Air and Space Museum, uh, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, uh, the American Women's History Museum initiative at the time, and the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in, in New York. And what we were able to do with those four muse uh, eight museums um, over, over a year, year and a half, 
was to reflect upon the skills that they needed as digital leaders in their organization to, to see through digital change. And it enabled us to uh, develop this vocabulary, which is about you know, understanding the importance of collaborative approaches, anticipation, letting go of authority occasionally, being mindful, but also about you know, the importance of a communication culture, assuming the, the need to adapt, being resilient and being empathetic. And I'm sure we can get into in questions afterwards how an inflection to all of those cards was the experience of the pandemic over that year, year and a half as well. The project started in the spring of 2020. We thought it would be a physical project. In the end, it became an entirely online project. We were with the eight heads of digital at those eight museums just in the very month where their executive boards were turning them to them and saying, the museum is closing. We're now pivoting the entire organization to digital. So we were with them at that moment where they were reflecting upon um, how to lead not just everyday digital change in their organization, but unprecedented, systemic and urgent digital transformation. We'll share with you in the chat the, um, the extraordinary podcast series by Sophie Frost called People Change Museums. Um, it's quite an emotional listen. It's a multiple part uh, podcast. Each episode is about 45 minutes to an hour. And what Sophie does is she spends time in each of those organizations and you hear sometimes live with those, those heads of digital still working their way through that change, then reflecting upon questions around emotional labor, questions around cultural identity, questions around equity and agency, and one particular episode, which is around precarity. We've never had to question that the museum and the library would never be there. Certainly in the museum sector, it's like a lighthouse, isn't it? On a rock, in the harbor, in the tempest. Yes, let's talk about how society will change and how funding will change and how government policies will change and how technology will change and the appetites and expectations of our audiences and culture will change, but the museum will be there. That was always a certainty. With a third of museums, in America at the time we were doing this research at risk of closure. And in the UK, one in 10 museum practitioners uh, losing their job or being followed and, and so on. For the first time, we had a sector that could not assume that the museum would be there tomorrow. So precarity was very much um, a new aspect of these conversations around change. You're asking me to adopt and adapt to new technologies. You're asking me to think about the future of my museum, but I don't know if I will be here in the museum and I don't know if my museum will be here. And so for the first time, we've needed to bring those front and center into our questions around digital change. And I have to say, as I start to kind of bring this to a close, we have probably seen that as the most distinctive shift in our project over the last two years. In fact, let me, let me just close my slides at this point. Whereas five years ago, our focus was on technical skills, you know, what are the skills that we need to, 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 do, to do our job in the culture sector in the 21st century? And our second project with the US museums was very much about how, how might we lead transformation and make a case for digital change within our cultural organization. What we started to notice through that year was we've spent a very long time getting to understand the technology. We have spent a long time mastering the hardware and software. We then spent another decade trying to understand how to write policy, how to write strategy, how to start to embed that technology, not make a unique case for it, but to embed it within you know, the, 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 the vision and culture and, and identity of the institution itself. The bit we missed, the final bit of that classic triangle of technology and systems, business processes and policies was people, was the culture. You can have the most extraordinary 8K screens, you can have the fastest of 5G connections, you can throw a drone up in the sky and digitize the entire village around you. You can have remarkable photorealistic augmented reality experiences on phones and people's gallery in, in people's phones within a gallery experience. But if you don't have the staff that feel empowered with agency, with curiosity, with motivation and creativity and a, a mindset of adaption and resilience to work with that technology, then that technology won't deliver. It won't meet your ambition as an organization and the expectations of your audience. And so to end with, I will just say that the current two things, one on where we're going next and what we're doing now, the current 
projects that, that, that we're just coming to, to sort of midpoint at in, in, in the US is with um, the American Alliance of Museums. It's with organizations such as Museum Hue that work with BIPOC um, uh, uh, practitioners and te uh, technologists uh, across America. Uh, so black, indigenous and people of color working in technology. Uh, we're working with um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, Doretha Williams, who, who, who works there in the Smith Center there on digitization. And what we're asking now are fewer questions about how to get the technology to work, fewer questions about what competencies and capabilities I need, fewer questions about how to write a digital strategy and how to write policy and how to make a case to the executive about leading digital change. But most of our research at the moment now is about who's in the room, who's not in the room. Is the workplace that we're putting together for digital for our workforce, is it accessible to everyone? Where are the prejudices that are built into the vocabulary and ways of working within our sector? It's a conversation that's taken in an American context, they would use this phrase around race and racial injustice within the tech industry and within that vocabulary. It's about women in technology, noticing who's not in the room when these questions around digital strategy are being framed. And as a visually impaired person, the particular aspect of the project that's important to me is around disability and impairment as well. Are we thinking enough, not just about how the digital provision and programming that we put together for our audiences is accessible to everyone, but to what extent are the expectations we have of staff equally inclusive and equitable and accessible? A final 30 seconds. We are so lucky because on the back of these five years of these three one by one projects now starting tomorrow with the Canadian project as well, helping us think about skills and leadership and transformation and now equity and inclusion and agency. On the back of all of that, we are now this summer announcing something quite remarkable. Leicester is 100 years old. It is our centenary that we're celebrating last year and this year. And as well as funding 100 PhD scholarships, we're in the process of establishing five new institutes. And by the way, I'm so proud of my organization. We could have put up a monument or uh, put a new building together, but actually the investment that Leicester's making is in, is in 100 people, 100 doctoral scholarships, fully funded with a stipend across every single department of the university. As well as that, we are establishing five new research institutes that speak to the five challenges that, that we see of the 21st century that we think Leicester can make a contribution. They're around access to space, Leicester's heritage in, in, in leading space technology uh, research. They're around environmental sustainability. They're around precision medicine and the next generation of, of medicine at a, you know, a genetic and personalized level. They're about uh, structural chemical biology and understanding the fundamental building blocks of life, which again, Leicester, because of its work around genetics has, has, has been world leading. And the final institute, which I guess is an indication of how important digital is, the digital shift is within, within not just our sector, but the whole of society. The final institute is an, is, is an institute for digital culture. So I'll be the director of this institute and we have an opportunity over these next few months and years to design a 21st century research institute from scratch. And this is my offer to RLUK. I get to decline all the templates, all the workbooks that say this is how an institute works. I'm being asked and encouraged to be audaciously different, to decline the usual categories. I have no legacy systems. I get to build the team from scratch. I get to design the organization from scratch. I get to, to work out a different set of interactions and, and outputs and ways in which we may be in the sector, be in the world and be with our domain. So I'm leaving, you know, leaving that there to say to RLUK, I can't wait to start the conversation with all of you about how I can build a partnership with you, a new institute for digital culture not an institute that writes abstractly and esoterically about culture and digital, 
and puts that work on a shelf or behind the paywall, but an institute for the culture sector that does that collaborative work, action-based, strategically intelligent. We've got an opportunity now to institutionalize and create a stable platform for all that work we've been working on over the last few years. Thank you for your time today. And uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation continuing and you carrying on on this adventure with us. Thank you so much, Ross. That was incredible. It, um, amazingly um, sort of inspiring. And I don't think we've ever finished with such an exciting invitation to the community. <laughs> so I hope this is something colleagues will, will spend a few moments thinking about and, and posing some questions to Ross about how we as academic and research libraries, both in the UK and beyond, can contribute to this, can, can add our, our, our experiences and our, our hopes and expectations and, and bring our skills to these conversations. So please spend a few moments, um, start putting questions into chat, uh, sorry, into Q&A, and also feel free to raise your virtual hand um, as well if you'd like to ask a question uh, verbally uh, to us. Just to start things out though, I think what was so exciting was obviously that repeated emphasis on, on people. And, and we've touched on this in some of our seminars previously that actually people are the most important element and, and technology has frequently clouded that. But one of the things that you, you mentioned repeatedly was who's in the room. And the, obviously the one by one project has been, projects have been going on from 2017, they've crossed geographies, they've crossed the pandemic. And one of the things that I think we've all reflected on um, during the, the, the COVID-19 period is issues of digital poverty, of digital inequality, of digital exclusion, and the roles of museums, libraries and archives as digital and social infrastructure within their communities and their geographies and nations. So I just wanted to start, are you able to reflect on that a little further in terms of who's in the room and some of your experiences and reflections over the length of these three very diverse uh, and important projects around those issues of digital exclusion and the role that cultural institutions can play in combating that? Yeah, thanks Matt. And it's, it's, it's fundamental to all of this. You know, we, we've probably had some very broad brushed generalized discussions in the past and certainly my goodness, you know, 20, 30 years ago when libraries and museums were first tiptoeing onto the web in the mid 90s and organizations had to start reflecting upon how they use that new opportunities fund or the, you know, the People's Network money and NOF Digi and all of those funding, you know, 200 million pounds worth of government funding from the new Labour government that went into the library and museum and culture sector, um, you know, in that in that five year period after, um, you know, May, May 97. And we asked very generalized questions about, you know, who, who would be online and who wouldn't be online. And we know it's it's much more subtle than that in terms of um, the fault lines around the digital divide or, or as you say, digital poverty. Certainly our colleagues in the America in America are talking about it today. Unfortunately, because we wouldn't have asked for it this way, it took the pandemic for us to slow down and to see the subtle contours of where those gaps and those points of exclusion and those points of poverty and divide actually are. The, the research that the AHRC has been and some of the emergency funding that's, that's come out of Arts Council England as well, but particularly those, those pieces of research from the AHRC that have helped to think about who has access to technology and what assumptions can any organization make around technology um, when, when you know, designing its provision. It took the pandemic for us to notice that. I'm thinking of the work of Yesenli Babala here in the School of Museum Studies and her very careful, thoughtful consideration of educational resources. You know, what can schools assume in terms of the, the, the technological um, resources that pupils have around them? And therefore, what can cultural organizations assume that, 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 that kids will have access to? It's not as simple as saying, we put our resources online. You know, we put lesson plans online or we started to stream X, Y and Z. If it's a family that doesn't have a laptop at home, doesn't want to pay the tariff, um, there's a phone that doesn't have that particular you know, capability, then that content suddenly excluded. In the US context, the work of Stephanie Cunningham, and I would encourage everyone to look at Museum Hue, H-U-E, um, her extraordinary work, she's doing a mapping project across New York City at the moment, and she was sharing the findings of that at our last uh, one by one project management board. She's really understanding not just um, the digital 
capability and provision of various arts and cultural organizations across New York and noticing, noticing the differences there, but she's starting to evidence and build the data that explains where those points of poverty and divide and exclusion are within the community itself. So that's our next job now. Our next job is not only to break that generalization down and start to notice this in a more nuanced way, but do what Stephanie Cunningham's doing in Museum View, which is now to start building the evidence. So we can go to the funders, we can go to policymakers, and we can go to you know, research grant uh, boards and say, this is the point of need. We, we have the evidence now, this is what needs to be addressed. It took a pandemic, but at least now we can see um, where those divisions and uh, inequalities are. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Russell. And I think those are some of the reflections that we've had at some of the previous seminars as well. It, it did take a pandemic, but now, um, now this is this is time to really to make that change. We've got some questions coming in. Thank you for for uh, posting these, and please keep them coming in. So, first one's from from Jill. And this is quite a, a a general question, but it's about the potential for cross uh, sector collaborations. Obviously, on the call today, we've got museums, we've got archives, we've got libraries. So it's a big question, but what the potential is, particularly using some of the one by one uh, models and, and, and the cards to support cross sector collaboration between archives, libraries and museums using the one by one model. I think it's huge. And Jill, please, let's talk about it. Let's make this happen. You know, I, I you know, just in the preparation for today and the conversation with you know, the Research Library UK team, you know, we've already just started to notice potential. There is, we see this quite a lot across GLAM, don't we? You know, we, we notice it's almost, <laughs> forgive the geeky reference now, but the multiverse that we live in, that we are in these parallel universes where we are, we are dealing with the same questions around what to digitize, how to make accessible, how to develop the digital skills of our staff, how to respond to digital uh, changes within society and ensuring that we're relevant within that context, how to have a professional development framework that can you know, see someone through their career and always know, uh, uh, making sure that they're resourced around what they need to develop digitally. Um, what are those touch points digitally that we're making with our readers, users, you know, uh, customers, learners, and so on? We are having the same conversations and Partly, we are affected by the National Archives, you know, Arts Council, National Heritage, National Lottery Heritage Fund kind of silos that, they, that don't always put us in the same room, even the way perhaps, you know, the parts of Arts Council England, to take an English example, may look in one direction uh, in a UK context. Uh, and libraries in another, you know, people, extraordinary. The national treasure that is Nick Poole leading SILIP you know, doing extraordinary things, even raising a question in the last 72 hours about should we have a research platform for, for libraries? Yes, you should, and let's, let's do it together. I guess what I'm saying in a roundabout way is that structurally, strategically, you know, we risk being kind of siloed. What we need to do and is to mobilize as a workforce and mobilize as a sector and say, it's time to start sharing. What we've designed on one by one, it came from a museum sector need, but the digital culture compass is for everyone and has been designed that way. It works for theatre, it works for ballet, it works for dance, um, it works for libraries, it works for archives, but equally the cards we've put together, equally the care and calm framework that Lauren Vargas has put together, equally that keyword breakdown of agency and precarity and emotional labour and the work that Sophie Frost is doing, these work across the culture sector, which is why our new institute is looking exactly right across in that environment. I think it's on us to start convening um, and start assembling and working out how we can now bring our archive colleagues, our library colleagues and our museum and heritage colleagues together in the same room and have these questions. Otherwise, there is a significant risk that we're inventing very similar things in our parallel universes. And it's probably time that we should just collapse them into one universe to, to really stretch the Doctor Strange metaphor. And guess what I watched with my kids recently? No prizes. Um, but um, to, I'm going to try and squeeze two questions in. We've got, um, we've just got about five minutes. Um, and one's a fantastic question, question, the first one from Kristen, which is she's curious in terms of how the one by one methodology and the projects it's supported addresses issues of trust between people and institutions, employees and staff and institutions. So thinking about addressing uh, how addressing trust can help create a space that people who've been excluded in the past can feel safe to join. So I think it's a fantastic, fantastic question. So real question about trust there. 
Oh, thank you. Sorry, who was the question from? That was from Kristen. Kristen, thank you so much for that. Um, it's really important to us. I just keep saying those three words, trust, respect, and empathy. If you can just empathize with those around you and just pause in any meeting, in any project, at any moment when you're putting a strategy together and just start to see from those different perspectives, you will start to respect the fact that people have different roles and responsibilities and different reasons and motivations to be part of what you're putting together. And that's, and if you can articulate that and that's noticed, you can start building that trust. What we do on one by one is a few things. And I think three things I would say, Kristen. First of all, we do things slowly. Um, I think our projects take two years. You know, the first project took three years. The smash and grab, quick snapshot. We've interviewed 200 people. We can build a pie chart. Here are our findings. You know, it, it's questionable in terms of the rigor and it's questionable in terms of the nuance and subtlety it's showing, but it's no way to build trust as well. So we work really hard. We have a thing called the Digital Commons, which is our Mighty Networks online platform where, where we talk to each other. You know, we share our hopes and fears. We act like a community of practice. You know, we have a, a vocabulary, a set of tasks and a set of ambitions that we share and we support each other. We try and bring that emotional intelligence to work and we... You know, we think hard about you know, diversity, inclusion, equity and accessibility, and we make sure that that is that's prominent and articulated so everyone can bring them, their, their whole selves to work. Um, I think we also ensure, as well as doing things slowly, that we we involve all partners in the project by design. This is not universities conceiving a project and then asking a cultural organization to be an object of scrutiny or simply to be a venue or to be a partner, but in a very contained way. All of the museums that I've referred to from Cooper Hewitt to Science Museum, from uh, and Good for Cymru to um, the American Women's History Initiative, they were in the room when we were designing the project and responding to the needs. So they have a stake, they are invested and they are co-designers on this. And finally, Chris and I would say, as well as doing things slowly and carefully and showing that, that respect and empathy and genuinely and authentically partnering with people, not superficially partnering and using their venues and their, and their resources, but just every single day, working at that culture. I know it sounds glib and it sounds idealistic, but it's what we do. Every single email, every conversation, every meeting, every discussion like this, it's actually you know, bringing your whole self, being empathetic and building a culture, hopefully even in this hour we've had together where you know, you're trusted because you're being very honest, you're being very open, you've got clarity about where you want to go and hopefully people you know, can trust, trust you and be with you consequently. So take it slow share and never stop contributing. I think that that real sincere, sincere investment in people and not the fetishization of technology as really has been at the core of what you've, you've been saying. And that touches on the question that we, we had from, from one of our, our colleagues, Deirdre. I'm just going to give um, uh, the one final question now, because I know we're almost out of time, and that's from Steve. And that's in terms of how um, some of the museums that you've worked with have had to balance the operational side of technology use, such as catalogues and environmental control and visitor tracking, with that more innovative, uh, cultural and creative use, digital exhibitions and extended realities. Does this come up in your discussions at all, that, 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 that balance between that operational side and the innovative side in inverted commas, because I know there can be very innovative sides as well in terms of catalogues and, and, and other other things does that come up in terms of attention or a complementarity or, or how does that feature it's it's a, it's a brilliant question steve yes it does and it's, it's ever present and aware of time i'll give you a, a, a succinct answer it, it you know it was there when we were working with the museum of london who were you know obviously going through the huge changes they're going through at the moment on the one hand it was about supporting a new you know a directorate team to help them imagine you know, where they may head with digital at the same time of just putting in place some mechanisms for getting content to work for, for museums. It was working with National Museum Scotland. And on the one hand, again, you know, fantastic Rob Corston, head of digital there, Xerxes Mazda, the amazing team that they have with their ambition and their reach and their sense of responsibility across the museums in Scotland being, you know, helping them with that kind of articulation of where they might be. But at the same time, helping them to work with their HR department and their new media department to change three questions on the 
uh, annual staff appraisal form so that every member of staff got a conversation or you know the plan was to have a conversation about about digital skills as well final example cooper hewitt you know that organization absolutely using design they are a design museum so the idea is they're saying let's use a design idiom to therefore help us think about what digital is within our museum and the whole smithsonian so this the cooper hewitt is in it the place you go in the smithsonian to take a design mindset to how you might think about your audiences and experience and engagement because of the brilliant work of Carolyn Royston there. Amazing, innovative, inventive, you know, their new interaction lab working with Microsoft. My goodness, mind blowing. But at the same time, the famous Cooper Hewitt pen that was introduced, you know, five, 10 years ago, needing to sunset that huge Bloomberg philanthropic investment, capital investment one off. And now just thinking, how do we keep the screens on? What is it that someone does and touches and presses when they come into the museum now? In all of those cases, our conversation around building digital confidence, taking a contextual, holistic, purposeful approach, it was always about both. And, you know, a quick line, Steve, would say final 10 seconds would be, let's not underestimate the value of pace layering. You know, when you need to start categorizing, you know, what, what's my priority list here? Get that, that, those, those systems of record, the stuff that needs to happen to keep the lights on. Identify what those projects are. They can be in some way low risk, but they could be high investment. Those, 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 uh, uh, that pace layer, which is kind of systems of differentiation, those things that you're bringing in that are maybe a little bit different. You know, you have got an interactive table in that gallery. Again, the cost is high, but not so much as the, as the big systems. But actually, you're starting to get a little bit risky because it's new to you or you're still working out whether this is important in your sector. And then that higher pace level, those pace layer, that, that, those systems of invention, those are the, not always expensive, but they're high risk and they may fail. It's just starting to look at your list of projects and just differentiating even on those levels of record, differentiation and invention and seeing the risk is different. The reward might be different and the investment might be different. Even just having those conversations with people and then saying, right, what are the competencies, capabilities and literacies? Who's involved? And, and, and you know, what aspect of digital is it that you need in each of those layers? We're just breaking it down. I can see the table of cards emerging in front of this Matt. Thank you so much. And I think looking for the digital, and I think the digital compass, certainly I, I recommend everyone to go and have a look at that. It's something we've looked at previously. And I think it just in making those those in those small changes and that, that litmus test across your organization to see where digital can be, I think is um, it's a, a really incredible resource. So I urge everyone to go and have a look at that.